believe it or not, someday we're going to get back to normal and the pandemic will be behind us and it's going to feel like it was a distant memory. I know it's hard to believe. I'm looking forward to it as well. But in five or 10 years, we're going to look back and probably have a memory of a specific event that reminds us of the time when we realized the world is no longer normal. For me, it, it might be uh, this Thanksgiving when my wife made one of the best Thanksgiving meals I can remember, and I couldn't taste or smell anything because I had COVID, uh, and it kind of was bland. Um, fortunately, I've recovered. Uh, it may be, like many of you, the day that I came home and watched the news and watched in disbelief as an out-of-control mob was attacking our nation's capital. Uh, or it could be the day that I realized I had seen a full schedule of patients all virtually on Zoom, an app that I didn't even know existed a few weeks before that. Uh, whatever it may be for you, uh, that's going to be one of those things where we look back and go, wow, I remember when. It, but it's pretty undeniable that the world has changed and we are in a very difficult and challenging season. And as a psychologist, I, I get a daily front row seat uh, to how people are being affected by this, uh, as well as my own uh, family and life. And the question I'm asked more often than any other is, uh, how are we supposed to get through this? What's the best way to deal with this? And clearly there's no one single simple answer to that question. But I thought I would share sort of my plan that's working for me uh, of, of things that I think have, have helped me or are helping me kind of navigate through this difficult season uh, that we all are facing. Uh, and, and what I've done is I, I pull from uh, various sources. I pull from scripture, I pull from life experience, um, I pull from some ancient philosophers. Uh, and what I'm aware of in terms of the science of happiness and well-being, uh, what can those things offer that, uh, that could be helpful or sort of a building a toolbox to navigate through such a difficult time? So uh, let me start with the Stoic philosophers. I've always been a fan of the Stoics, and uh, if you're not a philosophy major, you may not be too familiar with the Stoics, but uh, the writings of Marcus Aurelius and Seneca and Epictetus have always appealed to me. Since I was first introduced to them in graduate school, I've been a fan of the Stoics. Uh, now, if you're not a philosophy major, uh, you may have the association most people have with the Stoics. The Stoics get a pretty bum rap. Most people think of Stoics as kind of grim and gloom and doom and sort of you know, stiff up, upper lip. But the fact is the Stoics were, were very much a fan of positive emotions and, and a full appreciation of life. So if you look at the, the writings of, of Seneca and Epictetus and, and Aurelius, um, one of the things that is a core guiding principle of the Stoics is the belief that everything in life can be separated into things that we can control and things that we can't control. Uh, and even uh, almost 2,000 years before Reinhold Niebuhr wrote the Serenity Prayer, which most of us are familiar with, was this core concept of we need to differentiate between what are the things in life that we can control and what are the things that we just simply have no control over. Um, and the Stoics would argue that most of the things that happen to us, we have very little uh, or no control over. And the best example they offered was the weather. Clearly, we have no illusions that we don't control the weather, but it absolutely affects us. Um, what they would say is that what we have control over is how we choose to respond to the things that happen to us. And just like we have a choice about how we adapt to the changing weather patterns of the week or even of the seasons, we can adjust to and adapt to the events in our life over which we have no control. Um, Epictetus has a, a quote that uh, is basically one of the origins of, of even today's modern psych psychological techniques of cognitive therapy. And he said this, he said, men are not affected by the events in their lives, but by the view they take of those events. And if I could paraphrase, I would say what, what he's saying is our attitudes and mindsets about the things that happen, as well as our response to those things, have a far greater impact on how they affect us than we could ever imagine. Hundreds of years after the Stoics, Viktor Frankl shared a similar idea in his book Man's Search for Meaning. 
Viktor Frankl was an Austrian psychiatrist who survived the Holocaust. His family was killed, his life work was destroyed, and he survived some unimaginable uh, conditions in, in the concentration camps of, of the Nazis. And after his ordeal, uh, when he was reflecting on his, his experience, uh, he wrote uh, the seminal work, Man's Search for Meaning. And in one of his famous quotes from that book is, is this, everything can be taken from a man but one thing, the last of the human freedoms, to choose one's attitude in any given set of circumstances, to choose one's own way. And he also wrote that between stimulus and response, there's a space. And in that space is our power to choose our response. And in our response lies our growth and our freedom. Uh, Admiral Jim Stockdale uh, graduated from the U.S. Naval Academy in 1947 and was a Navy fighter pilot in Vietnam. He was also a student of the writings of Epictetus. He spent seven and a half years as a POW in Vietnam, and he endured some brutal treatment uh, as a captive, um, including having his arms ripped from his sockets, his back broken, his legs crushed. And he says after he was eject, as he was ejecting from his plane, uh, after being shot down over Vietnam, he said to himself, quote, I'm leaving the world of technology and entering the world of Epictetus. Years after the war, he wrote several books and gave many talks, and he credited the philosophy of the Stoics with helping him survive his ordeal. In 1993, he gave a, a speech to King's College in London. And what he said, he told people that um, when he was parachuting to the ground, knowing what probably uh, lay ahead for him, he reminded himself that the Stoics kept two different files in their head. One file for things that were up to him, in other words, things he could control, and another for things that were not up to him, that the things he had no control over. And he said that if he, he, he realized if he coveted the things in the second file, that would doom him to fear and anxiety. And instead, he, he told himself to devote his total concern and control and involvement his, to, to things that he could control, which included his attitude about what was going on. And in one of his books, he wrote the following, you must never confuse faith that you will prevail in the end, which you can never afford to lose, with the discipline to confront the most brutal facts of your current reality, whatever they may be. Now these paragons of resilience, they didn't minimize their circumstances, or they didn't delude themselves about what they were facing. They recognized the difficult and in many cases horrific circumstances they were in. But rather than focus on those circumstances, they focused on choosing a healthy mindset and an optimal response to those circumstances. I think we could all benefit from their example in today's difficult and challenging times. So what's that look like? What does choosing a healthy mindset and a resilient response look like for us? Well, for me, I've kind of, I think of eight tools, eight things that, have helped, that are helping me kind of get through these difficult times. And uh, I'll share those with you. And the first one is, is really just focusing on the fundamental aspect of self-care. Now the term self-care, kind of people associate the term with selfish or they get uh, notions of pampering and spa days and, and things like that. And that's not really what I'm talking about or what we mean when we say self-care. It's none of those uh, any more than changing the oil regularly in your car is selfish or pampering. It's, it's maintenance that allows us to operate optimally. And so ironically, one of the things we neglect or, or stop doing when we're under stress or in a time of crisis is we, we sort of neglect self-care. Uh, so the fundamentals of self-care are things like exercise. Now we all know we should be exercising uh, always, right? But what we probably underestimate is how important it is in times of stress and difficulty. Uh, the current research shows that, that regular exercise is a powerful antidepressant and stress reducer. Um, it, in fact, in some studies, it was as powerful as medication in terms of treating depression. Um, we know that exercise is vital to not only our physical well-being, but really to our emotional well-being. And more and more research is showing how important that is. And sleep. Uh, now, now, sleep's getting a lot of research lately. Um, and, and more and more studies are confirming that getting sufficient restorative sleep is much more than just about not being tired. Uh, we know that sufficient sleep is vital to our cognitive functioning, our memory, our attention, our ability to recall things, our processing speed. 
Um, these are all things that are, are related to getting sufficient sleep. But we also now know that insufficient sleep is a tremendous risk, risk factor for developing depression. Um, so we really want to make sure we're, we're prioritizing and, and getting restorative sleep during times of stress. Then there's the basics of nutrition. Um, for most of us, comfort food uh, makes us feel temporarily better, particularly when we're stressed. We all know about stress eating. Uh, but the long-term studies uh, are, are showing that um, healthy eating is particularly important in times of stress uh, more than any other times. A, a, a one publication from Harvard Medical School reported that studies show diets that are high in vegetables, fruits, and unprocessed grains and fish are associated with 25 to 35 percent lower risks of depression when compared to more Western diets that are high in fat, sugar, and processed foods. And then part of self-care is avoiding self-sabotaging behaviors. Um, typically, the things that make us feel better temporarily actually have the, the opposite effect long term. Um, we're finding more and more, I'm seeing this in my own practice and we're reading about this more and more, people are increasing their use of alcohol uh, and, and other drugs. Um, we've all heard the term quarantini, um, but it's clear that this actually does not help us cope well in difficult or challenging times. In fact, we now know alcohol is shown to, to interfere significantly with restorative sleep and, and, pro and likely increases our stress levels. The second thing for me has been faith. Uh, faith uh, is something that, that I've relied on heavily during these times. And um, for people of faith, I think crises are opportunities for our faith to deepen and to grow. Now for me, faith, the essence of faith is really just simply trusting God and turning over outcomes to Him when things just don't make sense. Um, really easy to trust God when things are going the way I think they should much requires much more faith when things are not going the way I think they should and I have to trust that he's still in charge. Um, we know that in anxiety, uh, uncertainty intolerance is a big risk factor for anxiety. In other words, when we just don't know how things are going to turn out, oftentimes we just sort of feel that it's probably dangerous or we worry that it might not be good. Um, and, and when we, we can't see how things are going to end, in order to reassure, reassure ourselves that things will end well, our minds equate that uncertainty with danger or, or negative outcomes. Um, for me, I think it's important to remind myself that, that God is sovereign. In other words, He is in charge. And faith, for me, if I simplify it to its, its basic level, it's really two fundamental core truths. The first is that, that God knows more than I do. Uh, and the second is that he's good. And if I focus on those two things, I don't get quite as distracted by the questions of why he's allowing this or, or that to occur. Um, when I was a child, we would go on vacation every summer, usually to the beach, and I had no idea how to get to the beach, but I just knew if I sat in the back and let Dad drive, eventually we'd get there. I didn't question why he's turning this way or that or why he was stopping got impatient oftentimes and asked how much longer, but ultimately I just knew we'd get to the beach. Um, and, and I think in many ways, if I could just have that childlike faith that if God's driving, if I don't question every turn, but I just know He knows where we need to go, uh, I, can, I can set aside some of my anxiety and worry about things. Uh, if I look at the scripture, Psalm 46 says, God is our refuge and strength and ever-present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam and the mountains quake with their surging. Pretty scary times. Um, be still and know that I am God. That's a challenge, but it, it's also a comfort. Um, I think of the story when the disciples were in the boat uh, with Jesus and they were um, crossing the sea and a furious storm came. They all thought they were going to drown. And Jesus calmed the storm with a word. And then he asked his disciples, why were you afraid? I was with you all along. In Luke chapter 8, um, he asked them, where is your faith? I heard Tim Keller recently uh, comment that it's interesting that he asked them, where is your faith, rather than scolding them for having none, um, which reminds us that even people of faith occasionally doubt and fear. That, that's human nature. That's normal. But it's important to realize that fear is not 
necessarily an absence of faith, but just failure to find it when we need it. Um, the disciples ask each other after this, uh, this event, who is this? Even the waters and wind obey him. And I think the answer to who is this gets us back to the, the answer that, that God controls everything, knows more than I do, and that he's good. Um, in the midst of all the political unrest, which is, is added to, I think, some of the uncertainty and, and anxiety that most people are facing, I'm, I'm getting more and more people talking about how this has been affecting them. Uh, I've really clung to a verse in Colossians. Colossians 1.16 says this, For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He's never surprised by election outcomes. So I think if we as people of faith can believe that God is ultimately sovereign and ultimately good, then I think we can begin to rest assured that nothing is unfolding without his knowledge or consent. Uh, we're not allowed to know the whys uh, of these events, and we certainly may not agree with them or, or like them, but ultimately I believe God's given us how the story ends, uh, and in the end, in all in fact will be well. I believe that mature faith does not offer simplistic answers or platitudes, and it doesn't demand answers to every question, but instead mature faith simply trusts that God, in God's omnipotence, omniscience, and, and benevolence. In other words, he knows more than me, and he's good. The third thing that, that I'm drawing on and that I'm, I'm, I'm aware that's really important in times of stress is, is the sense of community. Um, we are created to be social beings. Study after study is showing that the quality of our relationships is one of, if not the most important predictor, not only of our emotional well-being, but also of our physical well-being. Uh, a really impressive long-term study from Harvard studied men in their 20s through their 80s. It's the longest study on human development that, uh, that we have to date. Uh, and what this study did is it followed them very closely, uh, interviews, interviews with family members, medical records, and it, it tried to determine what are the things that predict both physical and emotional well-being. And the study showed that the most powerful predictor of not only emotional well-being but physical well-being is the quality of our relationships. Um, and I think that's really important. During, during times of stress and adversity, we really need to prioritize those connections and those relationships and to draw strength and support from our friends, our families, and our community. Nurturing relationships requires more effort and creativity, certainly during a pandemic when we're supposed to be staying away from each other, but it's something we really should prioritize and look for ways to do. The fourth is uh, this sense of cultivating gratitude. Um, now, the discipline of cultivating gratitude, or, or what many say counting your blessings, uh, is really a very intentional behavior, and it has a much more powerful benefit than most of us realize. Uh, there's a lot of research on this, and uh, recent research is showing uh, such a powerful association between this behavior and positive emotions, well-being, uh, that it's very hard to ignore. Um, here's one example. One study showed that people who intentionally keep a gratitude list, simply just writing down things that they're grateful for or appreciate daily, show 23% lower levels of cortisol, which is a stress hormone, than those who did not. Uh, other studies have shown that intentional gratitude helps us to recover from loss and trauma quicker and also helps us to connect with others. Uh, in, in our personal relationships, if we consciously focus on the positive qualities of the people in our life, it shifts our mindset in those relationships so that we actually become more forgiving and tolerant of other people's inevitable shortcomings and we develop a greater appreciation for their strengths. John Gottman is arguably the world's foremost researcher on couples, marriages, uh, and, and what, what makes couples thrive, what separates couples who, who seem to be able to stay together and actually be happy versus those who either don't stay together or aren't happy together. And from his decades of research on couples, one of the seven things that he says differentiates couples who are happy from those who are not is that happy couples 
routinely focus on the qualities of their spouse that they admire, appreciate, and respect. In other words, they kind of keep a gratitude list. They remind themselves, these are the things I appreciate about you. Our minds tend to develop filters, um, and, and those filters tend to cause us to notice things more easily that are not going well or that we wish were different more than the things that are going well. This is known as negativity bias in my field. In other words, our brains sort of scan for things that we believe should be changed or that we don't like or that we wish were different. And this is particularly true when we're under stress or in times of crises. This filter not only highlights uh, and scans for the things that are going badly, but it actually makes it difficult to see the things that are going well. And the antidote to this is to develop a discipline of noticing naming and expressing gratitude for those things that we're grateful for and, and probably are taking for granted. Now, this, back to the Stoics, they have this technique called negative visualization. Uh, now, let me warn you, my wife says this technique does not work for her, and I'll tell you why, but for many people, it's very helpful. The technique's pretty simple. What it involves is simply just allow yourself to sort of glance at, don't dwell on, but glance at or imagine uh, losing something that is very important to you that you still have. For, uh, an example would be getting a call that uh, a family member has been killed. Now that's horrible and, and, and it makes us feel bad, but, but the purpose of that is to quickly realize how much you appreciate the fact that they're still here. In other words, uh, this technique is really designed to keep us from overlooking the things that we actually need to draw more appreciation from and to express more gratitude for. Uh, and, and it works. Most people say that actually works. When it, it's much like uh, I've, I've worked with many people who have survived a grim or fatal diagnoses, and they all report, mo most of them report that they see the world differently. They don't take for granted the things that they used to. They have greater appreciation for the things that they still have. And so this technique actually tends to increase our sense of appreciation for those things. Now, the reason my wife says I, I don't use that one is because she says, I have to keep my foot firmly on the brake of that runaway train in my mind that likes to speed down what if lane toward worst case scenarioville. And I get that. That makes sense. Uh, and she said, if I'd start to imagine these things, it sort of makes me uh, catastrophize. So that doesn't work for her, and, and she's wise to, to not use that. But if it does work for you, I, I hope you'll, you'll try it. Many people report that it does work well. Um, and so that's something that, that could help us. But it really helps to start each day and, and end each day by taking an inventory of those things that we're really thankful for. They don't have to be huge. It could be something simple, uh, something that we just would normally take for granted. You know, someone did a very you know, kind thing today to help me out. I'm grateful for that. I might overlook that if I'm not intentionally looking for that. But we just know that the research shows that people who do that experience more positive emotion and, and just more happiness in their life. And we could all use more of that during these times. A similar technique, and, and, and my fifth tool that I rely on a lot is, is called savoring. <clears throat> savoring is one of my favorite techniques. What that really means is um, squeezing as much of the joy out of a positive experience as I possibly can, leaving nothing on the table. Um, you know, think of, you know we, we think of savoring when we talk about savoring a, a good meal. Imagine going to your favorite restaurant, the one you maybe would pick on your anniversary or birthday, and you get the meal that, that you know, everything, the presentation is wonderful. You, you, you savor every part of it, just from the time you walk in the door to the linen on the table, to the aroma, the, the, all of the, each bite, you take your time. That's savoring. You don't just gulp it down and say, okay, I'm full, let's go. What a waste that would be. Think of the positive experience that you would just sort of be rushing through. I think we need to think about how can we do that in our day-to-day -day lives. There are so many big and, and small experiences that create positive emotion. How can we savor those? How can we extract and, 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 and maximize the positive emotions that those give us? Um, too often, I think we miss the joy of, of a good conversation uh, because we're distracted about the thoughts of what I need to do next or you know, something that happened, or, or we rush from one activity to another without just stopping to enjoy a beautiful sunrise uh, 
or, 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 or the, the joy of, a, of the solitude of, of a quiet moment. Uh, I am a sucker for sunsets. If I see a beautiful sunset, I will stop and take it in because it just makes me happy. Uh, and, and so I, I think these are the things we need to, to look for. And again, these can be little micro moments. These can be just simple things that we just say, you know what, that's, that, that's giving me some positive emotion. I want to savor that. Um, the best way to savor things is to be present, to, to be fully present in the moment. We'll talk more about that in a moment. But it also can include um, remembering positive events. Uh, there, there, there's a, a research that shows recalling positive events can produce positive emotions because we're, we're really savoring them in our memory. Um, experiencing the joy of a great trip, uh, a compliment received, or even the satisfaction of a goal achieved. These are all things that we can draw on that can produce more and more positive emotion in our life. The sixth thing, and this is getting a lot of research lately, is mindfulness. Uh, now mindfulness is, is sort of the, the buzzword of the day, uh, but for good reason. Um, a lot of people say, well, I don't really know if I understand what mindfulness means. Um, one of the key components of mindfulness is being fully aware of and engaged in the present. Uh, in other words, it's not being distracted by you know, all the other things that are going on, but really taking in the moment. Uh, this can be difficult because a lot of times we find ourselves, I call it rehearsing and rehashing. I'm rehearsing you know, what, what I need to do next or the conversation I'm, I, I need to have later, or I'm rehashing a conversation I had, um, trying to kind of you know, replay it in my head. And then we're also inundated by distractions, our phones, our computers, uh, it, it, just so much noise, so much static in, in our lives that it makes it difficult to really focus our attention on what's taking place in this very moment and to fully experience the positive emotions that those moments offer. Um, even when the present moment is unpleasant, being mindful helps us to become aware that this moment is temporary nothing lasts, um, and that whatever I'm facing right now, I can manage in this moment. Uh, I don't have to worry about how I'm going to manage it uh, tomorrow, next week, or next year. I just need to focus on it right now. What am I doing right now, uh, and how am I managing it? Furthermore, I, I think it's important that, that if, if, we look, if, we, if we're going to look for things that are going well, in other words, if we are going to kind of keep that gratitude list, uh, we have to be present and mindful in order to even notice them. Now, another aspect of mindfulness that's important is, this, is, is the concept of acceptance and suspending judgment. Let me talk for a moment about that. Acceptance is a word a lot of people trip over um, because uh, people say, well, I, I can't accept it because I, I don't like it or I don't agree with it. Acceptance has nothing to do with either. Acceptance is really just accepting, the lim again, the limitations of, of what I can control. Uh, if I can't control it, then it's futile and frustrating to try to change it or, or, or argue because I don't have any power to influence it. So it's only by accepting things and people as they are that I can then choose what I can control, which is my attitude and my response. Uh, I might accept that I don't like what I see, but I can choose how I will respond rather than by complaining about it endlessly or just worrying about it. I can, I can accept that I might not have all the answers, but I can choose to live with greater levels of uncertainty or even ambiguity. And I can accept that I can settle for less than I want in order to appreciate more of what I have. Now, suspending judgment means staying away from shoulds. Should is a word I always stop people and say, time out, you just use that word again. Um, what is that about? Uh, if I stay away from how I think people should act or how I think things should be, then I, I'm suspending judgment. The moment that I evaluate a circumstance uh, or a person according to the way I think they should be, then I'm establishing an expectation that's probably going to result in a bunch of negative emotions like disappointment or fear or frustration or anger. Harkening back to this idea that the only thing I can really control is my response to people and events, I do far better to suspend judgment, accept things and people as they are, particularly when I can't change them, and choose the best response I can whatever, to whatever I'm facing. The other problem with judging 
is that it's inversely related to understanding. In other words, uh, when I pass judgment on something, I'm concluding that I have already weighed the evidence and rendered a verdict. It's like when a judge hammers a gavel and, you know, case closed. There's just simply no more hearing of evidence. The more and the, lo the longer I can suspend judgment, the more I gain an understanding of people and of events. Um, I frequently encourage people to just stay curious. If there's someone in your life that, that really you have a hard time with, stay curious. In other words, just sort of just listen and, 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 and rather than judge, just try to understand. Now that doesn't mean you might, you, you'll eventually agree with them, but greater understanding allows us greater empathy. And, and, and also again, focuses on my response to that. Um, I can learn more when I suspend judgment. John Kabat-Zinn is the, is the creator of the Stress Reduction Clinic and Center for Mindfulness and Medicine at Harvard Medical School. And his definition of mindfulness is this, the awareness that arises from paying attention on purpose in the present moment and non-judgmentally. And about the present moment, back to the Stoics, Marcus Aurelius said that the present is a split second in eternity, minuscule, transitory, and insignificant. We tend to view our lives through our limited perspective of time. But if we can shift to a more eternal perspective, we begin to see that we're living through a very brief moment on a very, very long timeline. A mindful response to times like these can really be sort of a vaccine for our psyche. The seventh tool that, that I'm drawing strength from is this concept of service. Now. Uh, one of the most helpful things we can do when we're going through a difficult time sometimes seems counterintuitive because the more stressed, the more uh, difficult times are, the more I'm looking at my own sort of discontentment and how to feel better. But uh, what we know now from research is that looking for someone else to help may be one of the best things we can do. Uh, doing an, just doing a simple act of kindness really provides an immediate and significant boost to our level of happiness and joy. Um, there was a study where uh, two, two groups of people were, uh, were randomly selected. One, one half, the subjects were each given $20 and uh, told to spend that money on themselves. Just treat yourself, right? Do something good for yourself. Uh, uh, pamper yourself. Just buy something for you. The other half were given $20 and were told, use this money and spend it on someone else. They did a follow-up study, and what they found was, consistently, the people who spent the money on someone else reported significantly more positive emotions than the people who spent the money on themselves. Um, in a different study, uh, people were divided into three groups. One group was told uh, to do something, uh, an act of kindness to yourself. Once again, do something for yourself. Um, the second group was told, just do something uh, like an act of kindness, just in general, to the world, to society. And the third group was told, do an, a specific act of kindness toward a specific individual. It can be a different individual each day, but this was for like several weeks. They followed up those three groups, and the group that did a specific act of kindness to a specific individual showed the greatest increases in positive emotion. So it's pretty clear the research is showing more and more by doing something for someone, I'm actually increasing my level of happiness and positive emotion. The other benefit of helping someone else is, is when, especially when we're facing difficulty or adversity, is it, it forces us out of our tendency to sort of focus on our own suffering. In his autobiography, uh, former Navy SEAL David Goggins said that one of the things that helped him to get through Hell Week Hell Week is sort of an extreme boot camp in just human misery, is that he would focus on how he could encourage and help one of his boat crew. In other words, the seven or eight guys that he was going through this ordeal with. And what he said was that when he focused on making sure his teammates were going to get through it, he began to uh, be less focused on his own misery. And it actually found that helped him get through that. Um, uh, you know, as we said earlier, uh, in, in difficult times we develop filters that overemphasize the negative and filter out the positive, and serving others is a great way to change that filter. The last, for me, the last tool is, is this concept of, of using difficult times as a way to build resilience. 
Um, I think difficult times are sort of the gymnasium where we build the muscle of resilience. Uh, resilience, as I'm describing it, is really, I'm talking about the, the ability to mentally and emotionally cope with the crisis and to recover quickly from adversity, challenge, and setbacks. And it truly is a muscle. It would, be, it would be great if we just had this ready supply of resilience that we could draw from in difficult times, but it unfortunately does not work that way. It, is, it, it grows only through, patient, through practice and through exercise. Uh, and, and when times are difficult, it is the way we develop that skill, the only way, as a matter of fact. Um, I, believe, um, I believe it's important sometimes to, to recall people in history who faced significant challenges and exhibited great resilience during those times. I recently read the book by Eric Larson uh, about the, uh, the role of Winston Churchill and the, the, bombing of, the bombing raids of London during World War II. The book was more about Churchill's role, but what struck me from the book was sort of the resilience of the British people during that time. It was terrifying. Uh, the, the, the city of London was being bombed almost nightly and uh, the people would go to work, do their task. Rations were in short supply. Um, even the basics were difficult to get. Um, and then they would come home from work, spend up to an hour blacking out their windows so that the, the pilots couldn't see the, the lights from the city. And then just sort of waiting for the air raid sirens that could go off in the middle of the night where they'd have to get up and go to shelters. Then they'd get up and go to work the next day. It, it, during that time, they didn't know when it would end or if it would end. In fact, most people believed that these bombings were a precursor to the German invasion, and because the German military was so powerful and superior, most people thought they would, they would conquer England. Uh, but through that time, they showed remarkable resilience, courage, and bravery, and they really looked out for one another. Um, and they emerged victorious. Th this is where the you know, keep calm and carry on slogan came through. Um, but I think it's, it's helpful to draw from, from people, generations or, or people in history who have gone through times that were as, if not more difficult than the ones we're facing and modeled incredible resilience and, and bravery. Um, I think that can just be very, very helpful. So um, clearly there's no simple formula for getting through difficult and challenging times. Um, for me, the, these eight things are helping. Uh, I draw strength from them, I use them as often as I can, certainly not perfectly, uh, but I hope that toolbox can be, can be helpful for you. Finally, uh, I'll, I'll close with this. The Stoics had another suggestion that involved imagining your future story. Uh, and what that involves is, is imagine getting into a time machine and setting it for, say, 20, 20 years out, 20 years in the future. Now imagine someone who's younger, maybe your children, perhaps your grandchildren. Um, they didn't live through these times, but they, they've heard about them. But they want to hear about them from someone who actually went through them. You're going to have a story to tell. Now, the story won't just be about the facts. It'll be about your experience during those times. And you're either going to be able, and I'm going to be able to tell a story uh, that, that's a story of courage and service and resilience and coping, or I'll have a story that's a story of despondency, discouragement, and, and surrender. Um, I have an opportunity today to decide what story I'm going to tell in the future. I'm writing it day by day. We all do. Uh, my encouragement is that you, you write a story that you'll be excited to tell one day. Um, we will get through this. Uh, and I hope some of these things can help. Thank you.